So to answer his question, we had 95 baptisms just last summer at Little Galilee, and we had 1,776 campers, and it was just a great year, and what you just saw was just a little sprinkling of what happened at Little Galilee last summer during the 10 weeks of summer camp that we have. And before we get into God's Word today, I wanted to do a little bit more of an intro, uh, because lots of times I get to come into churches. This is one of the joys of uh, the role that I serve at Little Galley as the director. I've been in a different church from the middle of February, and I'll be in a different church through uh, the week right before Memorial Day weekend. I decided to take Easter Sunday off to be with my family at our home church, and I also decided to take Mother's Day off to be with my wife and our kids that day. But one of the joys of getting to go into all of these churches, these supporting churches, just like Muhammad Christian Church, is getting to meet you guys, getting to meet the people of our churches. And so uh, instead of you wondering about me, like this tall, gangly guy, I'm not Jeff, and you guys probably know that, I wanted to do a little bit of an intro to let you know about my family. And so I brought with me a picture of my family. There we are. Uh, my beautiful wife, Lori, and I, we've been married for 21 years, and we have four amazing kids. Uh, the one standing next to me, um, to your right, is our oldest son. His name is Drake. He is a almost 19-year-old freshman in college. Uh, he's a middle distance runner. He runs cross country and track for Greenville University. And he wants to impact the next generation uh, by becoming a high school special education teacher. And he also wants to be a high school track coach and impact students that way. Uh, on the other side of the picture is my oldest daughter. Her name is Hadley. And she is 15, so we are getting to learn how to drive all over again. The first time that my wife took my daughter Hadley out to drive several months ago, uh, when they got back, they pulled into our driveway, and they walked in the house, and my wife said, Honey, I'm tapping out. It is all you. It is better for our relationship that I'm not in the car with her right now. And so I said, That's great. I'll take care of it. And then we have our third child, our other son, Wow, look at that hair. Isn't that amazing? His name is Grady, and he is a sixth grader. And when COVID hit in 2020 and everything shut down, he just decided to stop cutting his hair as well. And if that's the worst thing he does in life, then I think I'll be okay. Uh, but I'm not sure that he'll ever cut his hair because that's the single most thing that people talk to him about uh, when he's out in public, and it's usually 40 year old women that are jealous. <laughs> of all the flowing hair that he has. And then we have our daughter, Jazzy, and as you can probably tell, we adopted her uh, through the foster system. My wife and I lived in Springfield for over a decade, ministering at a church there. And uh, just to pull back the curtain a little bit on our life, uh, because of the choices that her biological mother made uh, while she was pregnant with Jazzy, um, our life is hard sometimes. Uh, there were some uh, substance abuse uh, that happened, and so uh, we're, we're seeing some of those uh, ramifications now. Jazzy's a fifth grader, and her educational gaps and her social gaps just get, keep getting bigger and bigger. And so as you remember to pray for little Galley, uh, could you also remember to pray for my wife and I as we try to raise our four kids, because that is my first ministry, is my family. And so uh, I just wanted to let you guys know who I am and who my family is. And so when you come out to Little Galley this summer, whether it's to drop a kid off or to just come check in on the ministry that we're doing, and you'll see all six of us kind of hanging out, um, you'll kind of know who we are a little bit. It would really be a shame if I got up in front of you today and didn't say thank you. From the bottom of my heart, from the, the staff at Little Galley, thank you for what you do. Thank you for your generosity uh, to the camp. We would not be able to do what we do if it weren't for people like you and churches like you. Thank you for being generous, being faithful givers to your church right here in Muhammad, and then your church leadership turning around and giving that money away to ministries like Little Galilee. Just so you know, uh, you probably felt this a little bit in your own house, but the prices of everything are going up. And so the price for us to be able to put on a week of camp at Little Galley is going up. For one student to spend an entire week with us at camp, it costs about 
$495 for us to put that week of camp on for that student. And because of churches like you and because of individuals like you, the camp only has to charge $210 for one student to go to a week of camp because we can subsidize all the other money through your generous giving. And so thank you very much. As I think about Muhammad Christian Church, I want to echo the words of Paul that we find in Philippians chapter 1. Paul writes this. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And that's really how I view our relationship. We are partnering together to make Jesus famous in this part of Illinois and beyond. It's an honor, it's a joy to lead one of your partner ministries. Um, it's amazing to me that students and adults and families get to walk onto the campgrounds of Little Galley Christian Camp, not just in the summer, but all year round, and they get to take intentional steps towards Jesus. And that's why we exist. We exist to create environments so that people can come onto our grounds and take intentional steps towards Jesus. And I just want to say thank you for partnering with us. Before we dig into God's word, would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for these people. I thank you for this congregation, God. You have assembled this body of believers together beautifully. Thank you for the team that led us to your throne room in worship this morning. And God, right now, as we dig into your word, I just pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds to what you want to teach us. God, your word is alive and active, and we acknowledge that. Come teach us this morning. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Following advice or following directions can be really valuable, but only if the person that you are taking the advice from is worth taking advice from. Think about it. Uh, I'm just going to be real honest with you. You'd probably get really lost if you were following me on a camp out, if I didn't have my GPS. If I didn't have my phone or a compass, I would get really lost. And if you followed me, it wouldn't be very wise of you. Or, or maybe some of you have taken relationship advice. And when you look back on it, you're like, well, that person has a ton of broken relationships in their lives. Why was I taking relationship advice from those people? Who we listen to and who we follow determines where we end up not only on earth, but also in eternity. And this morning, what I want us to do, maybe for the first time, or maybe we're going to rediscover collectively that following Jesus and taking his advice is well worth it. We find one passage, one verse in John chapter 14 and just to give you a little bit of context, uh, Jesus is hanging out with his disciples and he's kind of um, teaching them, hey, I'm going to leave you and I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And, and actually, you can actually know where I'm going because I've already told you all of these things. And then one of the apostles, Thomas, some of us know him as Doubting Thomas, he's actually, he says, actually, Jesus, I have no clue where you're going. You've not told us, so how am I supposed to know? And then we find John chapter 14, verse 6. And it says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want to dig into that one verse with you today and learn some things and rediscover how amazing our Jesus is. When I've gone to the grocery store before, sometimes I'll go with my wife and we'll be shopping. And like most or some men do, I'll kind of like pick some things that I want and throw it in the cart and maybe do it behind my wife's back so that maybe she doesn't see until we get to the checkout line. And one of the things that I like to kind of grab off the shelf are cake mixes. I don't know if you guys have realized this, but 
Um, I haven't missed too many meals, if you can tell. But I love cake, and I've even re realized that I can even bake a cake from a cake mix. You see, all you have to do is take it off and flip it over, and there's these directions. And I, I've learned that if you add some water, maybe some oil, crack a few eggs, put it in, mix it all together, throw it in the pan, but first you have to remember to grease that pan. All right? And while you're doing all of that, you turn the oven on to 350 degrees, wait for it to preheat, and when you hear the bing, you know it's preheated, and then you put it all in that pan and you throw it in, and then 35 minutes later, voila, you have an amazing cake to eat. But sometimes I forget. Sometimes we forget to add the right ingredients. And, and sometimes I've even forgotten to grease the pan. And when I forget to grease the pan, you know, you're trying to get all that great cake out and it's all sticking and it's no good and it's all crumbly. Or sometimes I've forgotten or maybe added a little bit too much extra water. And you know what that happens when the cake comes out, that middle of the cake is just all gooey and runny because I've added too much stuff. Has anybody ever uh, accidentally put vinegar instead of oil into a cake mix? You know, you, when you do that, you have a very inedible cake at the end. I think sometimes our lives are a lot like that illustration of baking a cake. You see, Jesus gave us a very simple instruction if we want to know God himself. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We need to trust Jesus as our personal Savior. We need to trust him as our Lord because he's the only one that is going to provide a way to God. He's the only one that is going to give us forgiveness. He is the only one that is going to give us that relationship with him. He is the only one through eternal life in heaven. But sometimes changing the recipe or adding our own ingredients will not result in the relationship that God wants for us. And so the first thing that we have learned from this passage is that Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. Jesus claims that he is the way to God the Father. He's not just a way. He's not just another way. He is the way to God. He's saying, I'm the only way to gain eternal life. I'm the only way to have forgiveness of sin. I am the only way to have a perfect relationship with God. He's saying that you will not be forgiven. Let's flip, let's flip the idea. You won't be forgiven if you don't follow me. You won't have a relationship with God if you don't follow me. You won't have eternal life in heaven if you trust in someone like Buddha or Allah or maybe your own good works or maybe your own God that you have created in your life. Friends, we can't be spiritual enough we can't be religious enough. We can't hope that our good will outweigh our bad when it comes down to it. When we think about God, think about Jesus being the only way in the world that we are living in right now, that statement is very offensive to many people. But it's very life-saving to those of us who believe it. No other religion has a God who became human to die a brutal death, bearing the sins of the world, all of your sins, including your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. No other God forgives your sins by a pure gift of grace. A free gift. Nothing that you have done Nothing that you have earned will put you in right standing. No other God allows us to dwell in his presence for eternity because they have suffered the death that was for us. But not only did he suffer a death, he miraculously defeated that death 
in his resurrection. And we just got to celebrate that through communion. We got to celebrate that a couple weeks ago through Easter Sunday. But friends, that is not something that we only celebrate one day a week or one time a year. That is an every single day of the year thing that we get to celebrate. In Luke chapter 5, Luke records an event during Jesus' ministry years here on this earth. And during those years, those three years, he taught God's word, he healed the sick, he cast out demons, and many people believed that he was the son of God. And Luke writes about, in chapter 5, he writes about a story about a paralyzed man who needed help. And that paralyzed man was brought to Jesus by some friends. And Jesus saw the faith that they had in him, and he forgave the sins of that man. The scribes, the Pharisees, the the religious leaders of the day were incredibly offended by that because they knew that God was the only one that could forgive sins. And they didn't believe that Jesus was God's son. But Jesus, in this story, read their thoughts. Holy cow. Like, they didn't even say that they didn't believe. They didn't even say they were offended. Jesus read their thoughts. And he said, you know what? He basically said, you're right. Anyone can get up here and say, your sins are forgiven. But in order for you to believe, because I know you don't, I just read your thoughts, in order for you to believe, I'm going to do something that maybe is a little bit more incredible for your sight. I'm going to tell this man, not only are your sins forgiven, but I'm going to tell him, get up and walk, and he's going to be healed of his physical abilities. And he did it. Jesus said, get up and walk, and this man got up, took up his mat, and walked home. You see, Jesus has the same authority today that he did when he healed that man. He is God. He offers us forgiveness. And if we put our faith in him alone to save us, he is the only one that will give us that perfect relationship with God. And that perfect relationship with him is unhindered by our sins. The first thing that we learned is that Jesus is the way. The second thing that this passage says is that Jesus is the truth. Many people today like to make a comment, or they like to say something like this. I've found my own truth. I have found my own way. But if there are many truths, then what is false? What is the standard of true and false? Jesus says to his disciples in John 14 that he is truth. And as God, Jesus is the source. He is the embodiment of all truth. Therefore, anything that Jesus says, anything that Jesus does is going to be true. Nothing he says, nothing that he can do or be will be false. Nothing will be a lie. Because that would go against the character of this holy God that we worship. And as God, he is omniscient. He is all-knowing. If Jesus knows everything there possibly is to know, and he never lies, then I believe he must be worthy of our trust. Many of Jesus' disciples and those who believed in him, they were actually put to death. They were actually persecuted. They were hurt when they realized, when people realized that Jesus had died and and we all believe that he rose from the dead and then ascended back to heaven, lots of these Jesus followers were persecuted because of their belief in him. Some of them were beheaded. Some of them were stoned. Some of them were killed and fed to wild beasts. Why would people stay true to a God if they knew that it was fake. Why would they go through all of that? They weren't delusional. They knew that they had found the truth. And they were willing to stick by it no matter the cost. Have you found 
the truth in Jesus this morning. How many of you out there are fans of the TV show The Office? Anybody? Awesome, three of you, great. (laughs) In season six of the TV show The Office, there's an episode called Gossip. And paper company manager Michael Scott, he spreads these ridiculous rumors about many of his employees in order to cover up one truth. There's so much confusion, there's so much gossip, there's so many hurt feelings, and ultimately there's broken trust between the manager and the employees. And eventually they get to the bottom of it and they realize that Michael had started all of these rumors to cover up the mistake of him telling everyone this one truth that wasn't supposed to get out in the first place. The employees didn't laugh off all the lies. They took it seriously because they knew that there were all of these false information. There was all of this false information being spread. Think back to your school days. Think about it. If you walked into your classroom and you didn't know if your teacher was teaching you truth or if they were teaching you things that were false. Uh, What I didn't mention was that my wife is a second grade teacher. My mom was a sixth grade teacher and then a college professor. My mother-in-law taught first grade for 30 some odd years in her career. My grandma also was a first grade teacher for her entire career. And my grandpa was a principal. I'm surrounded by educators. And friends, we know that teachers teach truth. But if you didn't know that, you would probably lose a lot of faith in your teacher. You would probably uh, question everything that they were teaching you because you didn't know if what they were saying was true. Thankfully, Jesus is not a rumor-spreading boss like Michael Scott, and he is not a dishonest history teacher. You see, Jesus is perfect. He's good. He's the Holy Son of God who wants you to know the truth. He's not hiding it from you. He actually openly reveals it to you in his word, in scripture. And so I want to encourage you, Muhammad Christian Church, to dig into God's word daily so that you know his truth and you can know him better. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. And then the last thing that he said was that he is the life. Jesus is the life. Friends, I've got some bad news to share with you all this morning. Without Christ, each of us is dead in our sins. We have no life, spiritually speaking. And when we are spiritually dead, just like when someone is physically dead, we're unable to act. Paul tells the church in Ephesus these words in Ephesians 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Kind of sounds like the world that we live in right now, a little bit. Not a single one of us in this room can make the first move in our salvation. We cannot do that. We do not have that power. But I am so glad that the story does not end there. Because that would be really disheartening. The great and wonderful news is that with God, in his grace, he did make the first move. He sent his son Jesus to live on this earth and to die in our place so that we can be saved from what we deserve. The sins that we have committed tells us that we deserve death, an eternal death. But Jesus lived the perfect human life in our place. And when we trust in his death, when we trust in his resurrection alone to save us, we are made a new creation. 
You remember what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says? It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Friends, Paul isn't saying that you get a second shot at the the life that you're living right now. He's not saying that you get a better version of the life you're living right now. He is saying that when you are in Christ, you get a new life. Go and live it. When we trust in his death and resurrection alone to save us, not only are we made a new creation, but we are set free from sin and punishment. Romans 8 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. It has set you free. Do you believe that? Go and live in that freedom. Friends, I'll tell you what, I had an amazing time just about an hour ago with the high school Sunday school class here at Muhammad Christian Church, and we dug into Romans chapter 8 together, and we looked at that. That's amazing. When we trust in his death and his resurrection alone to save us, not only are we made a new creation, not only are we set free from sin and punishment, but we are secured for eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. John chapter 10, verse 28 says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. We are secured in our eternity. I can only speak for myself. But my life was stagnant and sinful before I knew Jesus Christ. Before him, before I knew him as my personal Lord and Savior, I was stagnant. I was just occupying space here on this earth. But after I put my faith in him alone, I was transformed. And I believe that that's probably your story as well. And I'm not saying that we are going to be perfect because we aren't. But Christ followers don't need to fulfill their sinful desires anymore because Christ has set us free from sin and he gave us the gift of eternal life. Like I said, I like to grab cake mixes off the shelf. Some other things that I like to take off the shelf are candy. I like Reese's peanut butter cups. Yep. You can bring me some this summer. No, just joking. But another thing that I like are jelly beans. Jelly beans are one of America's favorite candies. And Jelly Belly actually manufactures all sorts of flavors. Everything from birthday cake to coconut to blueberry to dirty dishwater and spoiled milk. <laughs> no thanks. But when those beans are ready for packaging, the perfect ones get packaged and sold. However, there are always some that are, as the website calls them, less than perfect. And these beans are set aside and they're put into bags like this, and they're sold as belly flops. <laughs> they're not packaged with those perfect beans, but they weren't good enough. They weren't good enough to pass the quality control test, and so they're sold as belly flops. And sometimes I feel like a belly flop. I feel imperfect. I feel like a sinner. I feel misshapen. And honestly, all of us, we are misshapen because at the core, we have this sinful nature. We have this sinful desire. No one actually is able to pass God's quality control test. Do you remember what Paul said in Romans 3, 23? He said, for all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. The Gabe Rutledge translation of that is, we're all screw-ups. None of us pass the test. But thankfully, 
We can trust in Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. And only by trusting in him can we have a new life. And this new life means that we are no longer sinners at the core, but we are saints. Because once we are forgiven of our sins, we have Christ's own righteousness covering us. God does not set us aside. He does not give up on us because we are imperfect, because we are misshapen. Instead, our lives are reshaped and our lives are claimed for him. There are many people in our world today that believe, that think that they are smart enough or that they are good enough to earn favor with God. And sometimes those same people, but sometimes we can fall into this same category as well, we become too lazy to think through these important matters and we just want to follow what our friends think or we just want to follow what our parents think or maybe our grandparents We think we understand more than God does about salvation, about forgiveness, about life. But when we trust in ourselves, when we trust in what others claim that is true, we're not only believing these lies, but we're also telling the world again, hey, we're spiritually dead. No matter how diligently we look, we won't find our own way to God. We won't find any other truth. Our spiritual lives, there's nothing outside the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus alone is the way and the truth and the life. And if you're struggling with that, I want to encourage you to search the scriptures. Talk to the leadership here at this church. They'd be more than willing to have a conversation with you. This is why I'm so excited about Little Galley this summer. You see, on June 4th, we start 10 straight weeks of summer camp. And one of the reasons why I am so excited for camp this summer is because all summer long, we are going to be asking all of our campers one simple three-word question. And the question is this, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? It's easy to say that we follow Jesus with our words, but do we really know who we are following? How can we know? How can our campers know without digging in to the scripture? You see, our campers this summer are going to be asked that question. But friends, we don't have to make up the answer. We don't have to make up the answer because in the book of John, just like we talked this morning in the book of John, John gives us, not really John, but Jesus gives us all of these I am statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. And all of these other I am statements. And those are the statements that we're digging into this summer, all summer long, for 10 weeks in a row. Knowing who Jesus is and believing in him is the only way that God will change our lives. It's the only way that God will change the lives of our campers. If you have any influence, over someone who is three years old through a high school graduate, I want you to encourage, I want to encourage you to talk to them about camp. Because this question, who is Jesus, is the most important question that they will answer their entire lives. Little side note, if it's a camper that has never, if it's someone that has never been a little galley before and they are going and they're going to spend an entire week with us it's free first time campers it's free for them we have people that love our ministry so much and they give to us on a monthly basis they give us money and they say we want this money to be spent by you giving it away for free weeks of camp we gave away 187 weeks of camp last summer to first time campers i'd like to double that this year 
We already have 1,014, as of Friday, when I was in the office last, 1,014 campers pre-registered. That's over 300 more campers pre-registered at this time of the year than last year. It's awesome. We've never been over 2,000 campers in a summer. That's my goal for this summer. And I know that you guys have influence over people that are three years old. We have camps for three-year-olds. It's a four-hour camp on a Saturday. All the way through high school graduates. As I've lived my 43 years of life, I've found it pretty easy for people, including myself, to substitute our own logic or the world's pleasure for the true life that Jesus offers. But as our campers get to dig into these I am statements of Jesus, they will discover that what Jesus offers is so much better than what the world can offer. And what he offers is himself. I said earlier today that my oldest son is a track athlete and cross-country runner, which means he runs a whole lot more than I have ever done in my life. When you are in college, those cross-country races are 8K races or 10K races, depending on the course. He's running anywhere from 50 to 70 miles a week in his training. And he has realized through his training that when he puts about 400 miles on a pair of shoes, when he bumps over that 400-mile mark, his shins start to hurt. And then he realizes, oh, I need to go ask mom and dad for more money to buy a new pair of shoes. <laughs> but friends, when we go and buy Drake a new pair of shoes, I could buy him the nicest pair of Nikes or Sauconies or New Balance or Hoka's, whatever he wants at the time. Or I could go to Walmart and buy the cheapest pair of shoes. I know what he would want me to do. When I am walking through the grocery store, picking things off the shelf, putting them in, in my basket, I could buy the double-stuffed Oreos, or I could buy those generic cream-filled chocolate sandwich cookies, yeah. as the package says. Friends, there's lots of ways to cook an egg. There's many ways to fold a t-shirt. There's probably even different routes that you could take to your house after you leave this place today. Most choices that you make in your everyday life, they actually can be substituted for something else. But there is no substitute when it comes to Jesus. And this summer, our campers will discover that there is only one way to a personal relationship with God. There's only one way to find forgiveness. There's only one way to find truth. There's only one way to live a life pleasing to God. There's only one way to find satisfaction. There's only one way to be protected. There is only one way to join God on his mission. And it's so easy to substitute trusting in what we think is right or blindly following what others say without filtering it through the thoughts and the words of Scripture. This summer, our campers will discover who Jesus really is. We're going to talk about forgiveness. We're going to talk about truth. We're going to talk about this life that Jesus wants us to have. And he is the only one that sustains us. He is the only one that is going to satisfy us as the bread of life. Jesus is our good shepherd. He is guarding us. He is guiding us. And lastly, we're going to see that Jesus is the light of the world and that we get to join him in shining that light into this dark world that we live in. Because this summer, what we're going to take to our campers is the fact that Jesus is irreplaceable. And we need to accept no other substitutes. Would you pray with me?